Imagine yourself frantically searching on Google with growing anxiety for the enigmatic term, the mark of the beast. It's not just mere curiosity, but rather a quest for the revelation of something that has intrigued humanity for centuries. After all, what is this mark of the beast? Imagine yourself in a world where every number carries a hidden meaning, a mystery that transcends time and space. Do you remember the excitement of wearing your favorite athlete's jersey, feeling like a part of something greater, or the joy of celebrating your own birth date, a unique moment in the universe? Now join me on a journey through the most enigmatic book ever written, The Apocalypse, where a particular number has captured the imagination and sparked heated debates over the centuries, the mark of the beast. This mark is not a simple sequence of digits. It represents a cosmic dilemma between two opposing forces, the mark of God versus the mark of the beast. The choice is yours, but the consequences unimaginable. Those who refuse the mark face a world where simple actions like buying and selling become impossible. A challenging scenario that has inspired countless books, passionate sermons and theories, ranging from implanted microchips to invisible marks, or even the credit cards we carry. But what does this mysterious mark really mean? The key to unraveling this enigma lies within the pages of the Apocalypse, a book filled with symbolism and hidden messages. Together, let's explore this world of prophecies and revelations, seeking to understand not only the mark of the beast, but also what it represents for humanity and the fate of each one of us. Prepare for a journey to the heart of one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible. In our journey into the unknown, symbols become our guide, lanterns illuminating the path through uncharted territories. In the book of Revelation, each symbol is a master key, unlocking dimensions that would otherwise remain sealed to our mortal eyes. It is crucial to understand that these symbols are not a veil to confuse, but rather a bridge to understanding. Throughout the centuries, many have chosen to see these symbols as indecipherable puzzles, getting lost in the shadows of their apparent ambiguity. However, as we dive deeper, we discover that when arranged into four enlightening categories, they reveal themselves with surprising clarity. The dragon emerges as the devil, the lake of fire reveals itself as hell, and the great white throne stands majestic as the Lord's tribunal. But it's not just these figures that come to life. Others, when seen in the right context, also reveal their secrets. Stars become angels, lampstands become churches, and seals, trumpets, and bowls become harbingers of imminent disasters. We stand on the threshold of an unprecedented time after the divine judgments of the six seals and trumpets. The world prepares for the final and most devastating series of disasters, a period where the forces of evil will exert an unprecedented influence. At the heart of this impending storm is the mark of the beast, a puzzle discussed in detail in Revelation 16. This section, considered a vision of the near future, calls us to confront not only our understanding, but also our moral and spiritual choice. Let us now navigate the waters of time, where the book of Revelation divides history into three distinct eras. The current era, covered by chapters 1 to 5, the near future from chapter 6 to 16, and the distant future, in the final chapters from 20 to 22. We are about to plunge into the near future, an era marked by the emergence of an enigmatic entity, the Beast of the Apocalypse. But who is this beast that intrigues and haunts us so much? The mark of the beast, this enigmatic symbol of power and control, is not a random creation, but the product of a being known as the beast. On the apocalyptic stage, three sinister characters emerge, weaving an alliance that seeks to dominate the world. The first, an angelic being, is the architect of evil, known in the annals of time as Satan or the Devil. His accomplices, two human beings, dark figures known as the Antichrist and the False Prophet. Together they form a profane trinity, a distorted parody of the sacred trinity of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. 
It is in chapter 13 that these two earthly beasts make their triumphant entrance. The first, a dominant and menacing presence, emerges as a political figure, a dictator who imposes his will on nations, known as the Antichrist. He is the embodiment of despotism, a lawless man whose will becomes the only law. Let's embark on a journey through the origins of a word that carries immense weight, a term that echoes through the centuries as an omen of cosmic challenges, the Antichrist. The Greek word Antichristos serves as our map, where anti means not only against but also in place of, and Christos is the Christ we know. The Antichrist, therefore, is not just an opponent but a usurper of the sacred place of Christ. This concept, deeply rooted in the biblical narrative, shines brightly in the epistles of John. It is there that the presence of the Antichrist is revealed not as one, but as many figures, each bringing the darkness of an end-time era. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. Thus, the first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 18, tells us, marking the time as a period of vigilance and revelation. And in the apocalypse, we are confronted with a breathtaking vision, a beast rising from the sea, adorned with horns and crowns, a leopard with bear's feet and a lion's mouth. The dragon, representing absolute evil, grants this beast its power, throne and great authority. Humanity, dazzled by a healing miracle, follows the beast with admiration and fear. But who is this beast, this Antichrist that emerges from the depths? He is a man, a human being who accepts what Christ rejected, a satanic offer of power and dominion. His rise, however, is insidious. Initially, he is just a shadow among us, going unnoticed even by the most vigilant. He is one of us, emerging from the mass of humanity, from the Gentile nations that the sea symbolizes in the scriptures. We are therefore facing a profound duality. The Antichrist is both a singular being and a collective phenomenon, a symbol of opposition and usurpation that calls us to discern and choose. As we unveil these truths, we are invited to reflect on our role in this cosmic drama, to recognize the signs of the times, and to decide on which side of eternity we will stand. In a world where power and mystery intertwine, many wonder how a single man could impose his mark on all of humanity. This is not an ordinary man, but a being invested with a power that defies understanding. He is capable of making war against the saints and prevailing, a figure that emerges from an alliance of world leaders, capturing global attention. For 42 months, his pride and blasphemy dominate, an era of proclaimed darkness. We have already explored the nature of the Antichrist, but he does not act alone. Alongside him arises a second beast a false prophet with supernatural powers, whose mission is to direct global worship toward his leader. This false prophet, a master of illusion, performs wonders that deceive nations, even commanding fire to fall from the sky and causing statues to speak, perpetuating worship of the dictator. Interestingly, his appearance is that of a lamb, a creature normally associated with innocence and purity, but with two horns revealing his true nature. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Revelation 13 verse 11. This description leads us to a visual and symbolic paradox, a being that appears harmless, but speaks with the voice of evil. In the shadow of the first beast, his powerful emissary arises, exercising absolute authority in his name and compelling the earth and its inhabitants to bow in worship. The miracle of healing a mortal wound becomes the catalyst for this blind worship, while the false prophet orchestrates a series of great signs, including calling fire from heaven to further solidify this cult. The inhabitants of the earth, mesmerized by these supernatural demonstrations, are persuaded to create an image in homage to the beast, an idol that not only symbolizes, but also speaks and demands worship. 
Those who refuse to bow before this image are threatened with death, a cruel directive that reveals the true nature of the power seeking to subjugate humanity. The false prophet then imposes the mark of the beast, a symbol of loyalty and submission, without which no one can buy or sell, a mark that represents not only physical control, but also spiritual subjugation. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Thus, Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17 not only describes a dystopian future, but also a spiritual battleground where freedom and servitude are at stake. In this imagined future, a mark becomes the dividing line, separating those under the rule of the beast and his false prophet from those who resist. It is a reminder that, even in the face of the most overwhelming oppression, the choice remains with us, to submit or resist, to blindly follow or seek the truth. This is not just an account of future events, but a call to awareness and determination in all times. In the new order foreseen by the apocalypse, a mark becomes the passport to economic participation, a key that opens or closes the doors of trade and survival. Without this mark, visibly inscribed on the body or forehead, individuals are excluded from society, unable to buy or sell, marginalized for their refusal to bow to imperial idolatry. This concept, once considered dystopian fiction, now flirts with reality as technology advances, making it possible to implement physical or digital marks that control access to the global economy. And so we arrive at the number that has sparked debates and speculations throughout the centuries, the enigmatic 666. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is 666. In this context, numbers take on a deep symbolic meaning. The apocalypse is filled with sevens. Stars, lampstands, lamps, seals, trumpets and bowls, each representing completeness and divine perfection. 666, on the other hand, represents a fundamental imperfection, human failure to attain divine holiness. The number six, always one step short of seven, is used here to unmask the true nature of the world's last dictator before the promised millennial reign of Jesus. Thus, 666 is not just a number, but a warning, an enigma that invites those with wisdom to decipher and understand the true nature of the approaching evil. In a deeper dive into the mysteries of this number, we contemplate its connections to ancient traditions, such as Roman numerals, where the sum of all but one curiously totals 666. But is this mere coincidence, or a symbol hidden in the shadows of history? The truth is that the search for the physical identity of the Antichrist, based on these calculations, remains an enigma, a web of conjectures that over the centuries has ensnared controversial historical figures like Napoleon and Stalin. The word mark itself, devoid of a specific biblical meaning, comes to life when associated with the beast. The Greek term karagma, commonly used for seals on coins and documents, harks back to the imperial seal of the Roman Empire, a symbol of authority and power. In the New Testament, the appearance of this term is rare, but when it arises, it carries a weight of meanings and implications, especially in Revelation and references to artistic images in Acts 17 verse 29. But what is the magnetism that leads the masses to accept the beast and its mark? The Antichrist is not only a figure of power, but also of seduction. Described as someone of remarkable appearance, he stands out among his own, capturing the admiration and loyalty of the world, not only with his presence, but also with a charismatic personality, persuasive eloquence, and enigmatic beauty. It is this lethal combination of power and attraction that causes people to willingly surrender to his influence, a reminder that evil often does not present itself with the expected ugliness, but with a face that invites admiration and fellowship.
The Apostle John, expanding on Daniel's vision, speaks of a time when the Antichrist, this charismatic and dangerous figure, will not be content to be a regional leader. He aspires to much more, global dominance, borderless tyranny, elevating himself to the position of a god among men. People, drawn by his eloquence and magnetic presence, will gather around him like moths to a flame, ready to follow his every command. He is not just a unifier of nations, but a master of words. Daniel warns us about this world leader, notorious for his golden rhetoric and seductive charm, who not only exalts himself, but also challenges God himself with arrogance and blasphemy. John echoes this description, depicting him as a beast, endowed with a mouth that utters arrogance and profanities, with the authority to reign for 42 months. But who will bow to this domineering figure? Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that all the inhabitants of the earth will bow in worship. Daniel 7 verse 25 reveals even more about this deceptive leader who will speak great words against the Most High, attempting to change times and laws, boldly positioning himself against the true God. The language suggests an attempt at divine usurpation, an arrogance that seeks to equal God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 completes the picture, describing the Antichrist as someone who opposes everything that is considered divine or sacred, even daring to sit in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. He not only desires power and worship, but also aspires to divinity, accepting the adoration of the deceived masses. In current discussions, many wonder, is the mark of the beast among us? Theories proliferate, speculating whether it will be a technologically advanced tattoo or part of a strategy devised by some visionary billionaire. However, the Bible clarifies the nature and timing of the mark. There is a divine timetable for its revelation, a specific point in the tapestry of time and space where it will manifest, and according to the scriptures, that moment has not yet arrived. The name Mark of the Beast is not a coincidence. It is a direct consequence of its origin, brought into existence by the being known as the Beast, the Antichrist. Until this global leader ascends to total power, the Mark will remain only a future shadow. The Bible tells us that the Beast and its Mark will only make their appearance on Earth at the midpoint of a seven-year tribulation. Therefore, any assumptions about the current existence of the mark are, at best, precursors of what is to come. The enigmatic 666 is often associated with this mark, a code name awaiting the arrival of its bearer, the final dictator. Until this leader is revealed, any attempt to decipher or attribute meaning to this number is premature. When the time comes, it is believed that his identity and the connection with this number will become clear. A reminder that, despite his pretensions, he will never attain the perfection symbolized by the number seven. The fate of those who choose to accept the mark of the beast is described with dark gravity in the pages of Revelation. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead, or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, a sentence that echoes with the force of a final verdict. Those who surrender to the worship of the beast and bear his mark will not only face earthly consequences, but will also drink from the pure cup of divine wrath, enduring eternal torment before the holy angels and the Lamb himself. This passage, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11, paints a picture of perpetual torment and despair for the worshippers of the beast, where the smoke of their suffering rises as a perennial reminder of their choices. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who, by their actions, choose the path of perdition. The relationship between worshipping the beast, his image, and receiving the mark on the forehead or the hand is inseparable and deliberate. The decision to accept the mark is not something that will be done carelessly or by mistake. There will be undeniable clarity about what this mark represents and the eternal implications of such a choice. The worship of the beast and the acceptance of his mark are acts that seal a covenant with the forces of destruction, 
a covenant that leads to eternal damnation. In the apparent simplicity of receiving the mark lies a choice that to many may seem innocent or even rational. In the minds of some, accepting the mark may be seen only as a pledge of loyalty and dedication to the Antichrist and his regime. This perception is not new. In the early centuries of Christianity, even the declaration Caesar is Lord was considered by many pagans a mere act of civic duty, with no greater spiritual implications. However, the scriptures warn us about the gravity of this decision. He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 14 verse 10. Those who choose to worship the Antichrist and receive his mark will be forced to confront the full intensity of divine wrath. This cup undiluted and fortified, symbolizes severe and inescapable judgment. The language used here is clear and uncompromising. God does not look favorably upon those who accept the mark. The image of the cup of God's wrath is one that resonates powerfully throughout the Bible, mentioned more than 13 times. Psalm 75 verse 8 offers a particularly vivid view. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours this out. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. This metaphor of foaming and mixed wine serves as a sinister representation of the divine judgment that awaits the wicked. This same cup is what Jesus hoped to avoid if possible, as expressed in Matthew 26 verse 39. In an act of supreme sacrifice, Jesus chose to bear the wrath that all of us deserved, a wrath symbolized by the wine in the cup. In contrast, his enemies will have no choice but to drink from this cup of divine wrath. The wrath of God, known in ancient Greek as Thymos, is often symbolized by wine, a representation of his unwavering indignation against sin and wickedness. While orge, another Greek word for wrath, typically describes God's constant attitude against sin, it is thymos that we encounter more frequently in the book of Revelation, indicating a more passionate and momentary fury. The intensity of this divine wrath is illustrated through the phrase, he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. This is a graphic reminder that the punishment expected for the wicked is not just a penalty, but a genuine and terrible torment, both painful and repulsive. The book of Revelation directly challenges the contemporary tendency to evade notions of condemnation and eternal judgment, presenting a series of undeniable realities about hell and the ultimate fate of those who choose the path of perdition. One of the most poignant descriptions on this theme tells us, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, they have no rest, day and night. Those who worship the Antichrist and receive his mark will face an eternity of separation and suffering, subjected to divine wrath and judgment. The expression forever and ever leaves no room for ambiguity or soft interpretations. In Greek, the language used is as emphatic as possible, conveying an unbreakable and endless eternity. The decision to accept the mark of the beast, then, is not just a fleeting mistake, but an error with deeply ingrained eternal consequences. When the bowls of God's wrath are poured out upon the earth, as described in Revelation 16, the true nature of the mark of the beast will be revealed in all its dreadful reality. The bowls, often referred to as the bowls of wrath, symbolize God's final judgments poured out upon the earth shortly before the end times. These are not mere metaphors but vessels of divine wrath, a direct response to the wickedness perpetrated, especially under the regime of the Antichrist. Imagine yourself in an apocalyptic scenario where the silence of the heavens is broken by a powerful voice echoing from within the temple. The words resonate with divine authority, echoing in the souls of the seven angels who are about to fulfill a haunting destiny. In this dark moment, Revelation 16 reveals a distressing proclamation, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God, a call that echoes like thunder, commanding a series of events that will change the course of humanity forever. 
the first angel, obedient to the heavenly voice, approaches the earth, holding in his hands a bowl filled with a mysterious liquid. In a solemn gesture, he pours the contents of the bowl upon the land, and then calamity is unleashed. A painful and cruel sore afflicts those who, in some way, had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The symbol of rebellion against the Creator, which they once proudly displayed, now becomes an unbearable burden. The skin of those marked by disobedience is filled with repulsive sores, marking them forever. At this moment, we recall the words of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6 verse 23 The wages of sin are painfully manifest before the eyes of the world, revealing divine justice. The remaining humanity, witnessing this terrible affliction, is faced with a crucial choice. Will they recognize this event as a sign of God's judgment and turn back to Him? Or will they harden their hearts and persist in the path of rebellion? The destiny of humanity hangs in the balance, and Revelation 16 is just the beginning of an epic story of redemption and judgment. As the subsequent bowls were poured out, the division between light and darkness, righteousness and wickedness, deepened even further. These were times when the words of the psalmist echoed like thunder, Hebrews 10, verse 31. Referring to the Old Testament, this warning came to life with every bowl poured out. However, even in divine wrath, God's mercy remained evident. This judgment, similar to the plagues of Egypt, had a clear purpose to serve as a solemn warning. The events described were not just meant to instill fear, but to highlight the profound consequences of a world turning its back on its creator. In this narrative, the seven bowls carry the weight of God's wrath. Each of them holds deep significance and premonitory messages. An appeal for repentance resonates in every drop poured. Remarkably, even amid the terrifying unfolding of these events, the heart of God remains constant. He longs for repentance and reconciliation. This is a striking revelation of the stubbornness of the human heart. Even when confronted with the undeniable power and judgment of God, many choose to defy the act of repentance. God's intention is never destruction alone. Instead, His judgments serve in part to lead people to an understanding of their need for Him. Essentially, the seven bowls of revelation are not just judgments, but messages. They echo the seriousness with which God views sin, demonstrate His deep desire for humanity to repent and return to Him, and reaffirm His promise to eradicate evil, establishing His eternal kingdom. The unfolding story is an epic battle between divine power and human stubbornness, where mercy and justice interweave in a conflict that will shape the destiny of humanity. For believers, these words offer a glimmer of hope, a solid reminder that no matter how dark the world may seem, God's light and truth will always triumph. As we contemplate the seven bowls being poured out, let us remember that revelation is not just about the end, but also about new beginnings. Beyond the bowls of wrath, there is the promise of a renewed creation, where pain, suffering and death will become distant memories. For those who heed the message and turn to the light, a new dawn awaits, ready to dispel the darkness hanging over humanity. Now you may be wondering, why is all of this so important? The answer is simple, because the Bible tells us that these events are like pieces of a puzzle that fit into a larger picture. They are events that will happen as part of God's grand plan, reminding us that He is in control of all things. The beast and all those who worship it, no matter how powerful they may seem, will meet their inevitable end when Jesus, the Savior, arrives. It is the culmination of divine justice, the ultimate victory over evil, and the promise of a renewed world where light will prevail forever. It is a story of redemption, a message of hope, and a reminder that even in the darkest of times, God's light never goes out. The Bible teaches us that the reign of the Antichrist will come to a dramatic end with the triumphant return of Jesus Christ. 
The book of Revelation, a prophetic vision conveyed to the Apostle John, provides us with a vivid description of this epic moment. In Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20, John describes the impactful scene, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. In these words, we witness the desperate gathering of the beast, earthly rulers, and their military forces, all determined to defy the one who rides in triumph. It is a futile attempt, for trying to fight against Jesus and his heavenly army from outside the earth is unimaginable folly. However, we should never underestimate the stubbornness and hostility of human beings towards God. It is the incurable madness of sin. John tells us that the intention of these powerful enemies was to make war against him, but this battle does not unfold in the way many might imagine. There is no description of a prolonged battle, but rather a direct act of divine judgment. Armageddon is the pinnacle of human arrogance confronting the irresistible power of God. After this confrontation, the beast is captured, along with the false prophet. Both are thrown alive into the lake of fire, a deserved fate that reflects the extreme gravity of their actions and deceptions. It is a stunning reminder that, in the end, justice prevails and God's divine plan is fulfilled. Jesus' triumph over the forces of evil is the culmination of a story that spans centuries and offers the promise of a new beginning for those who remained faithful to truth and light. And so before the great white throne of judgment, the sentence is pronounced, the beast, the false prophet, and all who aligned themselves with evil are cast alive into the lake of fire, as Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15 tells us. This day is not just an end, but also the beginning of something new, a source of hope that shines before humanity. At this crucial moment, the chains of deception are broken, and the path to redemption becomes clear. In the midst of darkness, God's truth always prevails. With the defeat of the Antichrist, hope and redemption begin to bloom in the world. This day is a testimony to the lasting power of faith and victory over evil. But what happens after this day, the millennium? After the fall of the Antichrist, Jesus will establish his rule on earth, often referred to as the Millennial Kingdom, due to its duration of a thousand years. During this period, Jesus will rule with justice and peace, fulfilling the prophecy of Revelation 20 verse 4, which declares, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The defeat of the Antichrist inaugurates an era of renewal, where hope and redemption begin to flourish in the world. The day the Antichrist fell was a testimony to the enduring power of faith and victory over evil. It was the day when the prophecy of Revelation 20 verse 10 was fulfilled as the devil, the great deceiver, was cast into the burning lake of sulfur along with the beast and the false prophet. This deceptive mark, which many followed, is a fraudulent copy of God's true mark, which is a mark on the right hand or forehead, symbolizing loyalty and devotion to him. The dawn of hope and the promise of the Millennial Kingdom remind us that, in the end, divine justice will triumph, and God's light will shine upon humanity, restoring it to eternal glory. Satan, the architect of deception, is not endowed with original creativity. All he can do is mimic God's deeds. Therefore, it is not surprising to discover that he has also woven a satanic parody of what God will do. His imitation extends to God's seal upon his people. In the mysterious and message-laden vision of the book of Revelation, we find a unique and significant representation of God's seal. This seal is like a special sign, indicating that God is protecting a specific group of people. It symbolizes that they belong to Him and are true followers of Him. During the turbulent period of tribulation, we see God's seal being applied as judgment is withheld until God's servants are sealed. 
This is vividly described in Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth, the sea, or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. These servants of God receive a protective seal on their foreheads, somehow containing the name of God. This seal is equated with the Holy Spirit given to believers, serving as a sign of their salvation and a guarantee of their eternal inheritance. It is a divine manifestation of protection and love, in contrast to the sinister parody of the Mark of the Beast. It is a powerful reminder that even in the midst of the greatest trials, the hand of God continues to guide and protect those who faithfully follow Him. The act of sealing, as described in the book of Revelation, goes beyond a mere physical mark. It is a divine manifestation of protection and ownership. In Revelation 7 verse 4 we read, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed, from every tribe of the sons of Israel. This sealing process is not limited to a literal mark, but symbolizes spiritual preservation in times of tribulation. The 144,000 were sealed for a distinct and special purpose, although the exact nature of that purpose is not revealed to us. However, the concept of being sealed is not limited to them. We find a similar example in Ezekiel 9 verse 4, where a protective seal was given to the righteous before the judgment of Jerusalem. In this context, those who opposed idolatry were marked on the forehead to be spared from death. The verse says, And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. This underscores that God's seal is a symbol of protection. Cain also received a protective mark, as we see in Genesis 4 verse 15, And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This reminds us of the significance of the book of Revelation. Before his death, Jesus prophesied that the Holy Spirit would reveal to his apostles the things that were to come. This prophecy was partially fulfilled through the teachings of Paul and Peter, but found its most complete fulfillment in the revelation given to the Apostle John while he was on the island of Patmos. The book of Revelation, with its mysterious visions and messages, serves as a crucial revelation of God's plan and the protection that God offers to those who faithfully follow Him in times of adversity. Thank you for watching this far. May God bless you and see you in the next video.